It's good. Welcome to Post-Colonial Studies. I'm Mr. Friesen, Alan the Friesen, YouTube channel. We're going to be talking today about something that I learned in university. And I'm extremely excited to do this today. I've not been able to teach this for several years, and I am thrilled to be able to do it now. My students are cheering as we speak. They're so happy to be here. So what we're going to be going over today is a very brief introduction to post-colonial studies. As I said, we could spend an entire year just doing this in English 30-1. Unfortunately, we've only got about a month and a half. So, because we've got such a limited amount of time and a limited number of texts that we can cover, I wanted to start off with an introductory lecture that's fairly short, but thorough, to give you a good overview of what post-colonial studies is. Now, post-colonial studies, if we were to sum it up into three words, it would be interruption and change. Interruption and change. Three words. So let me give you an example of how not to start an essay. Pretend that this is an essay. From the dawn of time, humans have attacked and enslaved other people. They've de they have conquered cities and countries, and they have killed and enslaved those they have defeated. In other words, human history is the story of colonization told from the perspective of the victors. And this is largely true. Throughout history, people groups attack other people groups, and then they take them and they say, you are our slaves. And the slaves either say, okay, or no, at which point the slaves get killed. This is colonization. One group taking over the land on the culture of another group. <clears throat> but when we're talking about post-colonialism, when we talk about post-colonial studies, we're referring to the colonization of third world, notice my ironic quotation marks because we talk about terminology later, Third world countries during the 19th century and the resultant independence during the mid 20th century. Africa does play a large role in this discipline, but it's not the only continent affected. In fact, uh, post-colonial studies, when you look at different cultures, they occur on they occur across the globe. So post-colonial studies deals with the legacy of colonized people after the colonizers have been driven out or have left of their own accord. History has been interrupted. Now what? How do we live? Do we find our old traditions, or do we stick with the ones thrust upon us by the colonizers? Does our culture become a mixture of tradition and colonization? How do we function as a society now that the past has been taken away from us? So critically, post-colonial studies concerns itself with European interruptions in history and how cultures have changed, interruption and change. There were many of these interruptions in the 19th century, so I'm just going to give you a few brief examples. So, Rwanda, in 1884, the Berlin Conference gives Rwanda to Germany. A bunch of men in Europe say, you can have this part of Africa, other European man. In 1959, there was the Rwandan Revolution. So from the period of 1884 to 1959, the country that we know as Rwanda did not belong to the Rwandan people. Kenya, a similar story. In 1885, it became a German protectorate. Then it declared independence in 1963. Morocco, <clears throat> excuse me. In 1912, France and Spain divided Morocco into French and Spanish protectorates. In 1956, Morocco gained independence after a resistance movement. Nigeria, 1885, was when it was officially taken over by Europe, or I'm sorry, by England. And then in 1960 was when it gained its independence. A lot of African countries. Let's talk about Canada. Canada, in the 16th century, this is when European settlers came over and started to make permanent colonies. Gradual colonization took place across the entire country. There was the pending declaration of statehood. And then there's the climax of assimilation of First Nations peoples in the 19th and 20th centuries. So First Nations peoples had their rights taken away from them uh, in the 20th century in the residential school system. They had their culture, they had their language. They had a lot taken away from them. In 1956, First Nations people were given formal citizenship in Canada. 1956. So Europeans came in the 16th century, and it was some 400 years later 
but 400 years later that they were said, okay, you now can be a citizen of Canada. There's still issues today with citizenship. There's still issues today with the treatment of First Nations people. First Nations reserves here in Canada are seen as pockets of third world countries or cultures in a first world country. So third world cultures, third world reserves in a first world country. And quite frankly, the way that Canada treats First Nations people is shameful, and it's still shameful. Our history as Canadians is full of shame for what has happened to them. Let's talk about Korea, because as we all know, Korea is awesome, and I love to talk about it as much as possible. In 1910, it was annexed by the Japanese. In 1950, sorry, in 1945, when the war was over, the country was divided up into two different nations. The USSR took protectorship. They protected what was known, now known as North Korea, and the USA came in and protected what is now known as South Korea. These two countries are still suffering the ideological trauma of division. It can be argued that historical Korea no longer exists, and that both North and South Korea continue to be extensions of Western ideology. <laughs> There's no traditional Korea that we can point to. We have North Korea, which is a Stalinist regime, and we have South Korea, which is as capitalist and as democratic as you can get. Really though, traditional models of Korean um, leadership, they're pretty much absent from both countries. And this was a result of interruption and change in the country. Other colonized countries include Mexico, virtually all of Central and South America, India, Pakistan, former USSR, Soviet, or satellite states, Australia, Iraq, Iran, Palestine, other Middle East countries, Ireland, Scotland. These are all countries that have been, to a certain extent in the modern era, been taken over by European countries, their values and their beliefs pushed aside in favor of European values and European beliefs. So let's quickly talk about terminology. Now you need to understand when we're talking about post-colonial studies, terminology is all a matter of perspective. A man walks into a cafe, detonates himself. One side is going to see this as an act of terrorism. The other is going to see this man as a freedom fighter. Perspective. So there's different ways to talk about the world. And because we are talking, generally speaking, about the West, we're talking about, um, we're talking about Europe, and we're talking about the rest of the world that has been colonized, there have, there have been some terms that have been come up, like first, for example, the first world and third world. The first world colonized the third world. This is a problematic division because it implies rank. The first world is better than the third world. So even in that language, there's still this assumed hierarchy, and therefore it's not a preferred terminology. The same can be said of developed and developing. Canada lives and is, is a developed nation, whereas Kenya is a developing nation. Well, it's, it's an absurd claim to make that Kenya is developing. Kenya is where Canada was 50 years ago. 50 years from now, or 20 or 10 or whatever, when Kenya is what Canada already is, they'll still say that Kenya is a developing nation and Canada is developed. It assumes that there's some point in development that stops and it's done. There's no more development. So this again is a problematic division. We have the idea of the rich versus the poor. Rich nations versus poor nations. But this is purely in terms of economics and I would argue purely in terms of power. There are countries in the world that have amazing natural resources in terms of oil, in terms of gold, in terms of, um, in terms of diamonds. And yet they're still considered to be poor countries because they're being exploited by corporations or by what we would call, and this is, this is the preferred nomenclature in post world studies, the difference between the majority and the minority world. Majority and minority. And the way that we're differentiating between the two different types of countries is purely based on population. That's it. Not about richness. Is a country rich because it has gold, or is it rich because it has amazing works of literature? Not first and third world. Oh, it's first world that's better than third world. 
developed versus developing. It's again, like I said, problematic. But if you base your definition of where the country fits in according to how many people they've got, this is a more this is a this is a more fair. Is that an English term? More fair, fairer. This is a better division. So instead of talking about the first world, we talk about the minority world. There's less people in Canada than there is in Mexico. When we talk about People, um, the, the poorer nations in the world, we don't say poorer nations, we say the majority world. And then we could talk about post-colonialism, colonialism, anti-colonialism. We're, we're talking about post-colonial because we're talking about after colonization, after countries have been colonized and the colonizers go home and they're left saying, now what? Uh, Indian writer Nayantara Sagal dislikes the term post-colonial because she considers that it implies that colonization by the British is the only important thing that has happened to India and that it denies the history that precedes British colonization and the continuing traditions stemming from those earlier periods. To call India, in, in other words, a post-colonial nation ignores the thousands of years of history beforehand. So she dislikes that term. You're not going to find that people agree on this subject. We're calling it post-colonial studies because you know, I mean, it originates from post-colonial theory, which we will talk about in a little bit. I acknowledge that it's a problematic term, but by and large, it's the best one we've got, so that's what we're going to use. <clears throat> and then consider an event that happened in 1857. We're still talking about terminology. So this was during the British colonization of India. There was an event that happened that's been described in three different ways, under three different titles. 1857 was the year of the Indian Mutiny. 1857 was the year of the First War of Indian Independence. 1857 was the year of the Great Indian Uprising. All three of these titles refer to the same event but it depends on the perspective again. If you're British, perhaps you see it as the Indian Mutiny. If you believe in, um, if you believe in Indian nationalism, perhaps it's the first war of Indian independence. But you need to understand that these terms, this terminology, it's very fluid. It's not something that's set in stone. 50 years from now when people watch this video, they say minority and majority world. That's just weird. And they're using their new terms that are more preferred. So why literature? Why are we doing this in English class? Mr. Friesen, this sounds like social. I've heard it every year that I've taught this. And it does sound like social because we're talking about nationhood. We're talking about the idea of colonization. These are all terms that bring up the little red flags of, oh my goodness, it's the teacher next door. I don't want to be there. I'm in English because English is awesome and better. Calm down. This is still the English that you know and love. But the reason that we're studying this in English class, it, there's, a, there's a few reasons. First of all, the idea of literary theory. This has been the domain of English in universities. Literary theory. This is where we study literary theory. So therefore, it naturally extends that what comes after literary theory, post-colonial studies as opposed to post-colonial criticism or post-colonial theory, which I will get to in a second, I promise. It, it makes sense that these also fall within the realm of, of English. Now, we are going to be studying poems, short stories, essays, and a novel. For that reason alone, perhaps we could call this English. But in my opinion, this is a post-colonial um, post studies, you know, writing literature that talks about what your culture is like and what it's become. It's an egalitarian way for the majority world to tell their story. Anybody can pick up a pen and write. And in this day and age, anybody can get their work in front of somebody else, whether that's through a published book or whether it's through a blog post. Writing is egalitarian. Anybody can do it, and you can get it to anybody else. One of the primary tenets of writing is write what you know. We all tell stories, and literature is a natural way to explore our reactions to history. And also, post-colonial studies offers us snapshots into history. 
It's, it's close, it's not quite the same, but it's a close approximation of first-hand accounts of what happened in history. So when we read Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe, which was written in the 50s, and we look at his history of Nigeria and the Igbo people, it's not the same thing as actually being there and getting first-hand accounts, but it is certainly a way for us to look at the history of Nigeria through a Nigerian author. And language is another issue that we need to talk about, because we're studying language from around the world. I mean, we mentioned various places in Africa, Mexico, India, Palestine, other Middle East countries, Ireland, Scotland. So what language are we going to be studying this all in? And for post-colonial writers, this has been a contentious issue as well. If you write in English, or if you write in French, you're writing in the language of the colonizers. This is problematic. The British came in, and they occupied a country. And they occupied it for, in the case of India, hundreds, more than 100 years, several hundred years, a very long time. And then when they left, India, our English becomes the main language. It's problematic to write in English if you're an Indian because that's the language of the colonizer. But at the same time, it's also the language that allows um, the, your message to spread far and wide. Now, it's not just English, of course. There's also French, there's also German, whatever European countries. Uh, whenever they occupied various parts around the world, they brought their language with them. Is it better to write in English and French, or is it better to write in the vernacular, the language of the people? If you're a Senegalese writer, do you choose French, or you, do you choose Wolof? Wolof is known by 80% of people in Senegal right now, but outside of Senegal, it's not a well-known language. If you were to write in English, like I said, it carries with it those problems, but you could write your novel in English and have it read by a Canadian, or an Australian, or an American without the barrier of translation. The purpose depends. It, it, what, what language a uh, post-colonial writer chooses to write it, it depends on what they want to do with it. If the purpose is to build up a national literature, some agree that it's best to write in a national language. There are some nations, and I go back to Senegal again, that has 12 major languages, the most common being French and Wolof. But if you're trying to develop a uh, rich repository of literature in one of these lesser known languages, you run the risk of the, what you write becoming obsolete. It's hard enough to get published. I mean, I said before that writing is very egalitarian. It's true. But if you want to become a published novelist, it's difficult enough to do that in English, let alone in Wolof. So there's also that practicality to consider. The final thing I want to talk about in this very brief, very whirlwind introduction is, is the idea, you know, students have asked me, well, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing that colonization is taking place? Is it good or bad? Well, there's some good things about it and there's some bad things about it in general. But I want to direct your attention to a, to a thinker whose name is Homi Baba. Homi Baba is a very interesting, very erudite man who writes in such a way so as the common man finds it very difficult to understand what he's saying. But what he talks about is the idea of hybridity. England came to India, occupied it, taught it different things than what it knew, and then left. The question is, was that a good thing? Was that a bad thing? Baba would say it's both and it's neither. It's not all good, it's not all bad. India is now a hybrid culture between what it used to be and British influence. It's a hybrid culture. So he would argue that for better or for worse, these hybrid cultures take elements from the colonized and the colonizers' cultures and smash them together to create something new. Whether that's a good thing or not, that's the question. But it's hard to talk about, it, it, it's hard to discuss 
postcolonialism and say it's a good thing, it's a bad thing in, in absolutes. Because as we all know, only Sith deal in absolutes. And if there was somebody who watched Star Wars in my classroom right now, they'd be laughing. But you didn't get it. But you didn't get it. <laughs> so over the course of this unit, we're going to be looking at the following texts. We're going to look at The White Man's Burden and Gunga Din, both poems written by Rud uh, Rudyard Kipling. We're going to be reading um, a chapter of Concerning Violence by Frantz Fanon, which is translated from French. We're going to be looking at an article called An Image of Africa, Racism in Conrad's Heart of Darkness, a seminal article by uh, Chinua Achebe that deconstructs, takes apart the classic book Heart of Darkness. We're going to be reading the book Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. And then we're going to be watching three films. We're going to watch The Battle of Algiers, Hotel Rwanda, and The Constant Garner. Now, I could spend this entire year discussing texts, going through this. We only have a few weeks. We have about six, six weeks or so on this. So we're going to do our best. This is a very brief, very whirlwind introduction to post-colonial theory. If you've got any questions, ask me after the video or in the comments field. But aside from that, that's it. I'm so excited to begin. Thank you. Thank you.